Good morning and welcome to Hard to Believe, our 35th Town Hall conversation this morning. Thank you to everybody for joining. I'm Ed Jones, I'm President and CEO of the Houston Methodist Research Institute, and it's my pleasure today to host. Uh, Dr. Mark Boom sends his regrets. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the Austin legislature is in session and he found himself over there uh, trying to ensure that we maintain our viability as a uh, marquee health system this morning. So he sends his regrets, but again, my distinct pleasure to host today. Last month, we focused on ENT, and we had a lively discussion. I think with the rain today, we're going to try and keep our head above water and stick with uh, ophthalmology today. So we'll focus moving from ENT into, into the eyes. As we move into our session, I wanted to remind everyone, as always, we welcome your participation in the town hall, and we invite you to participate in one of two ways. You can text your questions directly to the set by first texting the word DeBakey to 37 dash 607 and then asking your question. You can also post questions on the live stream chat box. You may find that one a little bit easier where Sarah Chapman will um, help assist and bring those questions forward to us. And so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andy Lee, who is the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at Houston Methodist and the Blanton Eye Institute to kick us off this morning. Hello. My name is Andy Lee, and I'm the chairman of the Blanton Eye Institute at Houston Methodist Hospital. And on behalf of Houston Methodist Hospital's Department of Ophthalmology, I'm pleased to introduce to you your speakers for today from our department, Dr. Amina Malik and Dr. Raul Pundit. Dr. Malik is the director of our oculoplastics and orbit service and a specialist in oculoplastic surgery, which involves the lid, the orbit, and the surrounding structures. And Dr. Malik completed her college at the University of Akron in a record amount of time and went on to the University of Cincinnati where she did her residency and oculoplastics and orbital fellowship. As the director of our oculoplastics and orbital service, we're very pleased to have Dr. Malik with us in the Houston Methodist Hospital Methodist Eye Associates as well as our Plant and Eye Institute. And I think you'll enjoy her presentation today. Dr. Pundit, is a graduate of Yale undergraduate, and then went on to Rush in his hometown of Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Pundit is the director of our cornea and refractive surgery service, and has been named on multiple lists as a best doctor and a best provider, and, and most recently has had tremendous uh, exposure and recognition for his work in cornea and refractive uh, surgery. So on behalf of the Blanton Eye Institute, I'm really pleased to be able to bring to you these two outstanding speakers, and I hope that you'll enjoy their talks. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining uh, this morning, as uh, it is my pleasure to discuss with you combating droopy eyelids. So Hiram Powers was a famous American sculptor from the mid-1800s who was quoted to have said, the eye is the window of the soul, the mouth the door. The intellect, the will, are seen in the eye, the emotions, sensibilities, and affections in the mouth. The animals look for man's intentions right into his eyes. Even a rat, when you hunt him and bring him to bay, looks you in the eye. So this quote really underscores how the eye truly is the window to the soul. So when we talk about aesthetic surgery around the eyes, we're really trying to maintain a refreshed frame for that window. Research has looked at what we look at when we're deciding patients or other individuals levels of energy as well as their age and results have shown that most of the visual cues that we have that influence our perception of age and energy levels come from around the eyes so the periocular area really is an area of our face that says a lot about us and our energy level and the american society of plastic surgery quoted eyelid surgery as the third most common aesthetic surgery performed in 2019 and really that number has only risen over the last several years during the covid mask era where our eyes are really all that we had to show so here's just an example of two individuals foreheads where you probably can't say much about who they are another look at the lower third of the face and you might have a little bit more information about who these individuals are but just one look at their eyes and it's pretty evident that it's president barack obama and brad pitt again just highlighting how our eyes are the focal part of us as individuals. 
Now, Al Yarbis was a Soviet psychologist who did much research in the 1960s tracking eye movements. And what you can see on the bottom graphs uh, that when we interact with other humans, we spend the majority of the time looking at other people's eyes. Again, just underscoring the importance of this area. So when we talk about a useful eyelid, what are the features that sort of define it? Well, there's a few different things to consider. First is the position of the eyebrow. So the eyebrow in women typically should rest at or above the frontal bone. In men, it can be a little lower at the level of the frontal bone, which is the bone on top of the eye. A youthful eyelid is also marked by a well-defined lid crease where you don't see a lot of redundant skin and an open eye where you can usually see at least three to four millimeters between the black pupil through which light enters and the margin of the eyelid. Now when you contrast this to an aging eyelid, you can see several changes that start to develop. This can be uh, marked by brow descent, as you can see the brow tends to fall below the rim. You can also see increased skin between the brow and the eyelid. And in some patients, the lid can actually close or start to fall, which we'll show examples of later on in the talk. So aside from just the physical changes that can occur and the cosmetic changes uh, that patients experience with droopy eyelids, what is the impact? So I see patients with droopy eyelids every day and it really can affect their quality of life in many ways. And some of the classic quotes I hear on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel tired, I run into objects because I can't see in the periphery, I have to physically turn my head when I drive, I fall asleep when I'm reading because my eyes are so droopy. I constantly have to raise my brows to see, and my eyes feel heavy and I just feel tired. So the, the eyelid changes really goes beyond just a physical change and can really influence their day-to-day -day life. Here's a schematic of a patient who's driving with normal vision contrasted to one who has eyelid hooding. And you can see there's a marked shadowing or obstruction in the periphery in patients who have hooded eyelids. And this can be quantified actually in the office. We have visual field machines where patients are asked to push a button every time they see a light in the periphery. Now this is an actual field uh, test from one of my patients who was undergoing uh, blepharoplasty or interested in blepharoplasty surgery, which we'll talk about later. But what you can see in the untaped version where their lid is just in the natural position, all of the black spots on the top are spots that they cannot see. The test is then repeated with their lid physically taped up to their forehead and you can see that the black spots have now disappeared and, it can, uh, and the patients can actually see. And this is really done to show insurance companies the effect of the droopy eyelid on patients' vision and quality of life. So why do we develop droopy eyelids? Well. Genetics is a huge factor. So if your parents or siblings have droopy eyelids, there's a pretty good chance that you'll end up with them as well. UV exposure, we know, can accelerate aging um, in other places in the face, and the eyelids are no exception. Smoking can also contribute to droopy eyelids, and mechanical rubbing is a big factor, and this sometimes surprises patients, but if we're constantly and vigorously rubbing our eyelids, that can lead to stretching of the very thin and delicate eyelid tissue. Or if you sleep on one side or sleep on your face, that can also contribute. Contact lens wear can also contribute to droopy eyelids. When you are manually raising your upper eyelid, that can lead to stretching of the thin muscle that elevates the lid, which you know we're talking about millimeters in thickness. So it's a very delicate area. And then of course, the inevitable aging process uh, contributes to this as well. So then there's the question of what actually is a droopy eyelid? Well, there are actually three components that make up the eyelid evaluation and that can contribute to this droopiness. So the first factor to pay attention to is the position of the eyebrow. And I mentioned this earlier, how in women this tends to, this should rest uh, slightly above the frontal bone, but over time it can start to descend and you can get, uh, I'm gonna try to use, oh, sorry, the highlighter. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll avoid the highlighter. Um, but you can see in the red arrow that the brow can uh, descend and that is called brow ptosis. The second factor you wanna pay attention to is the amount of eyelid skin. So we only need about two centimeters of upper lid skin in order for our eye to close. And over time that lid can stretch. And when you develop that redundant skin, that's called dermatochalasis. And the third component is where the eyelid actually rests on the eye. We saw in the earlier photographs where you can see several millimeters between the pupil and the lid margin. But uh, due to several factors over time, sometimes patients can develop 
eyelid ptosis or eyelid closure, where again, the colored part of the eye is being obstructed by the lid. And so each of these three components have different treatment approaches. So we'll talk about each of those, starting with the brows. So again, um, this is a gentleman who you can see the brows have fallen due to age-related changes with the descent and deflation of some of the soft tissues. And if you look to the um, picture on your left, the, uh, it depicts some of the muscles that are important uh, to the brow position. So the frontalis muscle uh, is the muscle that elevates your eyebrow. And that's um, often what patients recruit to help see when they have droopy eyelids. So they'll constantly be raising their eyebrow by way of the frontalis. And you can see that the muscle kind of ends near the tail of the eyebrow, which is why a lot of times the tail of the brow descends more than the central part of the eyebrow. In addition, there are brow depressors, which uh, contract our brows and uh, cause that furrowed brows. Um, and those are called the corrugator and the procerus. Then they live in between the uh, eyebrow area. So how do we uh, treat brow ptosis when we have this? Well, those brow depressors can come into play when we talk about non-surgical options uh, via Botox, and this is considered a chemical lift. So Botox can paralyze some of the muscles in the area uh, in between the eyebrows to allow for the elevators to work unopposed. So this can lead to a subtle brow lift in patients who have mild uh, brow ptosis. It can give just a little natural lift. Um, again, in patients who have more mild ptosis, that brow ptosis, that could be an option. Now, direct brow plasty can also be performed, um, and this is done directly on top of the brow hairs where we make an incision and remove an ellipse of the skin on top to lift the brows. Uh, this patient also had eyelid surgery, but the best candidate for this type of surgery would be someone who has thick eyebrows where you can hide the incisions or might have some pre-existent forehead wrinkles so that the incision is not noticeable. So patient selection is really important when we talk about how to raise the brow. We can also do a pretracheal lift by going in front of the hairline and tunneling down to raise the forehead. We can also perform what's called a transbluff brow plasty, where we use the incision from the eyelid, uh, which we'll go into detail a little bit later, um, and can put a tacking stitch to sort of secure the brow, the tail of the brow, up to the bone back where it belongs. Um, and a lot of these before and afters are also combined with eyelid surgery, but you can see uh, the different approaches to the brow lift. And then endoscopic brow lift is a great approach, where, uh, which is minimally invasive with scalp incisions that are hidden in the hairline and using an endoscope to tunnel down and raise the brows up to their natural position to help uh, raise the lid as well. As, as we saw earlier, the lid position is very dependent on the eyebrows. Now, what about dermatochalasis or the extra eyelid skin? So this really is my bread and butter surgery and uh, their, their mainstay for treatment of this is called a blepharoplasty. So this is an in-office surgery, it's 20 to 30 minutes, and it's a one week recovery where patients should just limit their physical activity. And in terms of longevity, it should last a minimum of five to 10 years, but over time, the lid can restretch. And so how is this done? Uh, well, the most important step of this surgery is the lid marking. And so I am very careful with this where you use a caliper to measure uh, the lid crease. And then again, you measure from the eyebrow how much skin you're going to remove. And patients often ask how much skin you remove. Really, that's not as important as how much you leave behind because again, you need about two centimeters for your eyelid to close. So it's important to carefully measure that. And then also do a little pinch test with a forcep to make sure that the eyelid is not opening once you remove that skin to prevent any post-op issues there. And then we numb the eyelid with some local anesthesia and make an incision, remove the skin, and close it with a running stitch that stays in for about a week. And this is an example of one patient before, one week after, where you can see there are some bruising and sorry, one uh, immediately post-op where you can see there is some bruising and swelling, and then at one week post-op where that um, has improved and will continue to subside over several months. Um, and other examples of a patient one week on the left with some uh, residual bruising, and then at a month out uh, where you can see uh, a marked improvement in that peripheral hooding. And you can imagine how much brighter things appear with that shelf of uh, skin gone in these patients uh, post-operatively. And you know, males also seek this surgery for the same reasons to help with that peripheral vision. 
And in terms of scarring, you know, patients are concerned about whether it's visible. Because it hides in the lid crease, it really is not uh, very visible unless the eye is closed. And over time, it tends to fade and be nearly imperceptible. Um, this is an example at six weeks out with some um, residual redness that will continue to fade over six to 12 months. Now shifting gears to eyelid ptosis. Again, this is where the lid is closed. We talked about the brow droop and the extra eyelid skin. So eyelid ptosis is when uh, the lid covers the superior part of the eye. And this can occur, as we talked about, due to age-related changes, genetics, but also neurological diseases um, can cause this, such as myasthenia gravis, Horner syndrome, or cranial nerve three palsy. So it's really important that you're seeking an eyelid expert or a neuro-ophthalmologist when you have uh, ptosis or a closed eyelid to make sure there's no other etiology. So how do we go about fixing ptosis or a closed eyelid? So this is a cross section of your upper eyelid anatomy and there's two main muscles that elevate the lid or that allow the eye to open. And that is the levator muscle, um, which is accessed from the outside and the Mueller's muscle, which is accessed from the posterior surface. But we'll first talk about how we can raise the eyelid from a levator um, tightening or a levator external approach. So with this type of surgery, the incision is made again in the lid crease where it's hidden and dissection is carried until we found the muscle that elevates the lid again, the levator, and we put a tacking stitch in there um, to attach it to the connective tissue plate of the eyelid called the tersus. And then this patient is actually awake because we need to have them open their eyes so that we can check the lid contour in the opening. And once we are happy with the height and the contour, we'll tie that tacking stitch and close the incision. So depending on how many intraoperative adjustments are required, this can take anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes. Now the other muscle that we can tighten to achieve a similar result would be the Mueller's muscle, which is again accessed from the inside of the eyelid. And this is a schematic of that surgery where we flip the eyelid and we measure how much of the muscle we wanna remove, which is determined based on preoperative measurements that we make in clinic. We then place some stitches under that muscle, excise it, um, and this type of surgery takes about 20 to 30 minutes. <clears throat> so here are some examples of patients before and after ptosis repair. You can see this can be unilateral or bilateral and can really affect patients' peripheral vision and how much light is entering their eye. Um, and again, other examples of you know, the impact that this can have on patients' quality of life aside from the appearance. Now there is a non-surgical option for ptosis. This was FDA approved uh, recently. It's called Upneak, and this is oxymetazoline. And this works by stimulating the Mueller's muscle, which again is the muscle on the posterior surface of the eyelid. And this typically has an onset within five to 10 minutes. It can last anywhere from six to eight hours and is safe and, and well tolerated by most patients. So in patients who are not ready to have surgery or might not be surgical candidates, this is a, a really great alternative as well. So that was a lot of information we covered, but some take home tips of what you can do to combat drooping eyelids. Important to always wear UV protection, sunglasses, hat, sunscreen. Avoid mechanical rubbing of your eyelids. Avoid smoking. And when all else fails, you can find a local oculoplastic surgeon who is again an ophthalmologist who then goes on to do a two year fellowship in oculoplastics um, dedicated to all of the tissues around the eyes. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Malik. That was a brilliant overview. Um, we've had a few questions that have come in, but I think we'll hold questions at this point um, and turn the floor over to Dr. Pundit, who will give us his overview, and then we'll have a chance for questions afterwards. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, and it's great to follow Amina um, from her talk. We're going to shift gears quite a bit now to the area around the eye to the actual eyeball. And as uh, our chairperson, Andy Lee, had introduced me as a cornea specialist, part of the area that we cover in general is the front of the eye, or as we say, anterior segment diseases. And conditions and surgeries, of course, and part of that is cataract surgery. So today I'd like to take a bit of a break from the cornea and focus on cataract. And you'll see why the two are actually related. Um, cataract surgery in this day and age is an outpatient rapid surgery with a quick recovery. 99% uh, of the time, no needle, no stitch surgery. That's how we tell our patients about it, and that's kind of what their expectations are. Cataract surgery improves visual functioning dramatically and quality of life. We have plenty of decades of studies to demonstrate this, and that's only improved over time as the rapid res uh, resolution from cataract surgery and healing has improved over time as well. 
The lens implants we use are designed to be lenses for life, so they are not meant to be changed. People who have cataract surgery can expect to have good vision for the remainder of their life, assuming they don't have any other ocular conditions that occur. Um, in normal eyes, uh, the incision is less than an eighth of an inch. Um, the surgery is just about 10 to 20 minutes, uh, and we usually operate one eye at a time with a second eye within a week or two of the first eye so that the patient can be balanced between their two eyes. You can see that cataract surgery has come a long way. Um, this is probably the most rapid type of surgery we have currently with our 10 to 20 minute timeline. But you know, in the old days, perhaps the old couching technique, which was a pin in the eye, pushing the lens down was a little bit more rapid, but obviously not as, satisfaction, not as satisfactory for our patients. So altogether, it's a really pleasant experience with minimal pain and minimal post-operative healing for the patient. Um, why is cataract surgery like cornea and refractive surgery for me? Well, the positive experiences that we've had with our patients from LASIK and other types of refractive surgeries, which are designed to correct their vision and remove their need for glasses or contact lenses, have translated to the cataract realm because patients expect these amazing results. If you look at some of the old studies from the LASIK patients, we have upwards of 93% of patients who achieve 20, 40 or better, better vision and 95% patient satisfaction overall with their LASIK surgery. If you look at cataract surgery, our results are not quite as good. If you look at the graph on the right or the chart on the right, you can see that we measure things by diopters of correction. So if you look at the middle yellow line, if we're off by about plus or half plus or minus half a diopter, that's like taking two turns on the wheel of the little four opter machine that you sit in when you go to your eye doctor to get your glasses updated. That's pretty insignificant overall and that translates to about a 2020 or 2025 visual result in our patients. You can see we're only about 71% there with all of our best cataract tools and measurement devices and surgeries now. If we increase the, um, the, the, uh, the range of, of success to one diopter, we're, we're pretty good, but that means that patients could be perhaps 20, 30, or 20, 40 after their cataract surgery. So what can we do to get them to that high satisfaction rate where we're achieving um, you know, upwards of um, 90, 85, 90% of patients getting to plus or minus one or two lines of vision, meaning pretty close to 20, 20 vision? Well, that requires a lot of updates to technology and surgical techniques, and we'll go over a little bit of that right now to introduce you to the realm of cataract surgery. One of the greatest advances we've had in the last 10 to 15 years has been the introduction of lasers to assist us with cataract surgery. It's funny because when I started practice 20 years ago, my patients would always ask me, well, you do the surgery with a laser, don't you? And I'd say, I'm sorry, we really don't have that for cataract surgery. And of course, fast forward 20 years, we do. And so patients are immediately turned on by the fact that we have a high technology device to help us with our straightforward and relatively simple cataract surgery to make it even more efficient and more uh, of a rapid healing process for them. What does a laser do for me? Well, what I tell people is it makes a good surgeon great. And it does that because of a few things. One, it increases my precision. The laser incisions that I can do to the cornea help me reduce the astigmatism in the cornea of a patient. Upwards of 75% of patients have at least a mild to moderate amount of astigmatism, which is either corrected with a laser or in some cases advanced technology lenses which correct higher amounts. The enhanced cataract removal efficiency also helps with the speed of recovery. Uh, and then really it helps us meet our patient desires and expectations because patients really want that refractive result from our cataract surgery. They don't want just their cataract removed, they don't want to have to wear glasses afterwards. You can see the cookie cutter approach to laser assisted surgery. And that's kind of the one thing I tell my patients. If they ask me, what's the real benefit of laser? You're a good surgeon. Why do you need a laser to do what you do? I said, I don't need it, but it gives me more precision. If I'm accurate with my surgery, what I like is precision, which means I can get repeatable results. If I do this manual capsule rexus here, eh, it's, it's pretty good. But if a laser does it for me, it makes it the perfect size, shape, and diameter, and centration every time around. And that helps me achieve my repeatability of my good results. The technology has improved dramatically as far as lens implants go and this has furthered our ability to help meet patient needs. So what do patients want? They really don't want to have to wear glasses after cataract surgery. Ideally they can they can get away not just with distance correction which would be nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism but also perhaps not be so dependent on their reading glasses. 
And nowadays, of course, with all of our increased demand for computer, computer glasses, or that mid-range as we say. If you look at the impact that a cataract has on vision, on the far left, you'll see that it kind of makes things blurry and washes out some of the higher wavelength lights, the blues and all that. It gives you more of a reddish tinge, an orange tinge to your color. If you look at what a monofocal lens implant will do, if you take the cataract down and you put a standard lens implant in its place, you get the middle image on the left-hand side of the slide. And that improves the quality of vision overall. But if you correct astigmatism further, you can really enhance the quality of vision. And exa the example of that is given on the right where we've implanted a toric lens in a patient, which corrects a moderate to high amount of astigmatism. Again, the toric lenses are used for that amount when combined with a laser, whereas a laser alone can usually correct the mild amounts of astigmatism. And once again, what is astigmatism? Well, if your normal cornea is shaped like a soccer ball, as you can see on the top right, you'll see that a football-shaped cornea is more of an astigmatic cornea. It's oval or elliptical shape and it creates multiple or stretched focal points in a patient's vision. Some people describe their vision as uh, stretched out or, or kind of shadowy or maybe even double vision. Now, how can we improve the ability of patients to see with intermediate and near vision uh, uh, needs? Well, this we do uh, in many ways, but the, the, the most consistent way of doing that is with what we call diffractive optics. And what are we really trying to do? We're trying to take this, uh, this focal point in their vision uh, with a standard monofocal lens where you can see kind of light focusing at one point, which is where it hits their retina and they're able to see, and kind of stretching that out. You can see that thin green band is very, uh, very strong green band here extending over a, a broader range. So you can imagine if light is focusing in front or behind an object, it's still going to focus on the retina, and that's how we can get people to see at dis multiple distances. Again, diffractive optics can be used for many things, and it's used in, 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 in the industry in many ways. Um, multifocal optics uh, can be used in camera lenses, um, chromatic aberration correction, uh, even in space telescopes. It improves the depth of focus for patients, holographics, as you can see, uh, really advanced technologies like that. But this is perhaps the most consistent way that we can achieve um, uh, distance, intermediate, and near correction in our patients today. Now again, this is not an actual lens that changes shape like a young lens. This does it through, uh, through uh, playing with optics, so to speak. In a young lens that we all grew up with, our lens was able to change shape and that's how we could focus from distance to near. That's also the reason why we lose that in our 40s to 50s and we develop presbyopia, which is the age-related loss of reading vision. So once again, if you can take diffractive optics and you can take that single focal point at the bottom, which means that your image at distance is pretty good, but as you start getting up close, it's blurry, and you can extend that depth, uh, that focal point so you can actually see over a broader range and gets kind of sharper focusing at distance near with a couple of drop-offs here and there, you can see how you can improve the quality of vision for a patient at multiple ranges, not just their distance vision. Now, nothing comes without its potential downsides, and what are the downsides of diffractive, op diffractive optics these days? Well, there is a little bit of loss of contrast, which fortunately is not usually noticed by our patients because they're comparing a diffractive optic lens to their cataract, which has already lost a lot of contrast. But if you compared it to a standard monofocal lens, you might notice that difference. Generally speaking, these are um, shades of gray differences which aren't perceptible to most people in their day-to-day -day activities. But what can be perceptible is the, the next uh, item here, kind of what we describe as, di what we uh, call dysphotopsias, and describe to patients as either halos, glare, or starbursting with lights usually at nighttime and some of the examples really simulations because we can't capture what a patient is seeing are down below there where you might be able to see a point of light which is sharply focused on the bottom left whereas glare would appear as this kind of bright sunshine halo uh, and then a halo would be more like a ring around a light and then star bursting and, and other things that you can see there as well which have been described by some patients and in fact some cases drawn out very 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 art artfully by some of our patients to describe us you know what what are some of the side effects that they're seeing now the ma vast majority of these side effects uh, disappear over a course of three to six months. So most patients will adapt to these technologies uh, very well. And the fascinating thing is there has actually been documented evidence of neural networking or re-networking done in the brain to help a patient 
adapt to these lenses. And what does that mean? Well, we all look at objects all the time, we all see objects all the time, and we learn to tune in on the object that's wanted and, and, and desirable for us and tune out the things that aren't. Take, for example, floaters. Most of us develop floaters as we get older and we learn to live with them. Now, if I focus on my floater and look all the way around, I can see it and follow it, but I've learned to ignore it. And similarly, patients can do that with these. So the vast majority of patients do well in the long run with these type of uh, lenses. So what I'll take now is kind of a separate approach from that and introduce a little bit of a t conversation that I give um, uh, as a designated so-called premium cataract surgeon. Uh, what we try to do is we try to introduce the, uh, the concept of what makes cataract surgery a premium process for patients. And it's not just having a surgeon do great work or having, um, you know, uh, uh, having uh, uh, lens options that, that help these patients. It's really more about a collective approach to kind of providing that premium experience. And that's what Houston Methodist Eye Associates tries to provide. And so what I tell patients and what I tell some of our colleagues and some of the talks we do is that I take this kind of four T's approach to what provides a premium um, uh, experience for patients. Now you have to start with technology. Uh, we have some of the greatest technology at the Blanton Eye Institute at Houston Methodist Hospital. We were one of the first institutions in the country to have an OCT enabled microscope to give us this advanced imaging to help me really fine tune some of my precision surgeries including lens implants, refixations and, and things like that. So uh, at the leading edge of medicine but also at the leading edge of acquiring the technologies to help us do what we can do best for our patients. And you can see me straighten that lens out nicely in this image here which was tilted at first. This is me trying to repair uh, a dislocated lens um, uh, and try to refixate it and center it and, and, and avoid any tilt to improve the patient outcomes. Technology includes, for example, the laser I talked about. Laser guided imaging to really help us quantify the, the size and, and, and depth of the lens so we can make our, our incisions or our laser cuts into the lens as well as into the cornea to optimize our surgical correction for the patient. Once again, just to minimize their dependence on glasses and contact lenses afterwards. Uh, uh, technology to help me align toric lenses. When I have to put a toric lens in an eye, I have to be within five degrees of accuracy when I place that lens. Again, the lens is like a football. So if it's not pointing in the right direction, the patient's not going to see well. If I get it in the right direction and within five degrees, the patient will see well. And so the technology here helps me do that with what we call callisto registration. As you can see me lining up the lens perfectly with the uh, intraocular uh, um, uh, lining axis that, that appears, which is a combination of technology we use in our clinic, which is transferred digitally um, through, uh, through cables, of course, into our OR and allowed me to, uh, to uh, optimize my results there. Next is technique. Um, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to have some of the greatest teachers in ophthalmology help guide me and always constantly improve my technique. And I try to offer that to, to some colleagues and surgeons on my own website and YouTube channel. But the whole goal is to provide techniques that really help help uh, our patients achieve the best, uh, best outcomes. And part of this is just being on a constant search for advancements and improvements. Uh, this is attending meetings, talking to colleagues, asking for help from colleagues, asking how they're able to do something better, uh, and, and applying those techniques to our patients. Uh, doing a five-minute surgery uh, you know, helps with, uh, with patient satisfaction, pain relief, uh, and rapid, uh, rapid recovery, for example. Uh, nowadays, we have a lot of technology which really helps us learn uh, remotely, and that's obviously with the ad advent of the Internet. Once you have that, the goal is to also tailor re the results to your patients and look back at your outcomes. So when I published this study a few years ago on one of the newest advanced technology lenses, the first uh, extended depth of focus lens in the country, uh, improved in the U.S., approved in the U.S., uh, I went back and looked at our results and with the help of my wonderful staff and technicians who I have to shout out to in the office, was able to look at the results and kind of tweak and really hone down the results we were getting to so we could really optimize our patients, not just to that 2020 level, but really getting them even perhaps better than 2020 to the 2015 level. And then finally, it really is the team. So I constantly uh, talk about this in the OR. I always thank my OR team, but you know, it starts right in, right in our practice. We have some of the best providers at Houston Methodist Hospital. Uh, I've listed all nine of them here, plus I guess me being 10. 
Uh, we've got a team of OR uh, folks that are great and just really love to have fun. Uh, apparently they survived me every day as they gave me this, this fun button there. But the, the goal is to really just explain how we not only work together, but we really make this a process where we enjoy seeing each other. And I think that joy to work together really translates to the best results for our patients because we're there not only to work hard for our patients, but also to be, enjoy being in each other's company. And that translates to our team as well. I mean, you gotta have fun at work, and if you don't have fun at work, you're really not gonna enjoy the day, and you're not gonna always improve yourself to make the best of your, your day. To really have fun for your patients, to have fun for your staff, but also translate to just a good, positive environment where we can constantly focus on our patients as the end result. You know, we take, we take at Methodist, we take uh, eye care values very seriously. And, um, and part of that is just, an, a, you know, acknowledging not only the, the tools, uh, the, the techniques, uh, and tailoring our results, but really the team approach here. And I think that's what Blant and I and Houston Methodist Eye Associates does very well. And I'll close out with this quote that was gifted to me by my staff. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success by Henry Ford. And again, that's not just success for us, but that's success for what we do every day, which is improve patients' vision and provide them improvement in their quality of life. Thank you very much, Dr. Pundit. I think you said it amazing and well. I mean, here at Houston Methodist, I think everything is a team-based approach. And yeah. um, I think we've well grown beyond individual contributors, whether that's in medicine or science. We've had a few questions that have come in. And so um, I think I'll start with Dr. Malik and come back to our windows to the soul conversation. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions, the first question that came in, relates back to something you touched on, but I wonder if you could expand a little bit more. And that is, how does fixing droopy eyelids affect vision? What can patients expect um, for improved vision? What type of vision deficiencies do you see from droopy eyelids? Sure. So, <clears throat> you know, when you have extra eyelid skin that's kind of extending beyond the lashes, or a lid that's closed covering the superior part of the eye, that can significantly affect the peripheral vision. So a lot of times patients have run into doors or will run into objects because they're not seeing it on the outside. Um, or when they're driving, they've gotten into car accidents because their peripheral vision is obstructed from that droopy skin. Um, now in terms of actual visual acuity, like your ability to read font, the eyelid surgery is not going to have a huge impact on that. That's more for Dr. Pundit with the cornea and the, the lens. Um, but in terms of peripheral vision, when you raise the eyelid and remove that extra skin, you would really expect things to be uh, brighter from a peripheral vision aspect and just to be able to see more around you. Yeah, fantastic. So it really opens up your field uh, of view there. You know, one of the questions, and, and this one is if my... I, if I can add oh, to that, Ed. Of course. So one other actually great corollary with Amina and my work is when I see patients and I look at a mapping of their cornea, which looks for astigmatism, mm -hmm. and I see a real steep area up on top, I ask my, my um, technicians, do they have ptosis? And inevitably they do, because I can see it on the pattern of the cornea. I'm not looking at their eyelid, but I'm looking at their cornea mapping. So a lot of cases I have to send a patient to Dr. Mollick to get lid surgery done so that it can improve their topography so I can better plan for the visual outcome from their cataract surgery. So it actually really does have a direct impact to what we do to help patients' vision as well. Fantastic, coming back to that concept of team once right. again. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Mollick, you know, an observation I made on watching your presentation, it seemed that sort of your before and after mm -hmm pictures, there was one commonality, and it seemed like the after pictures, your patients almost had a hard time not smiling mm -hmm. on the after pictures. I wonder maybe if you could comment on what your experience is with the psychological effects of um, this type of correction. Absolutely. I think that's a huge component here. Um, you know, patients it's not just a vision thing, it affects their overall sense of well-being. When you have closed eyelids, and research has shown this, or droopy eyelids, it can cause patients to just feel low levels of energy and low levels of um, just alertness. When the uh, brain is stimulated from light coming in the eyes, and if that's limited from droopy lids, that can correlate to your overall functioning, um, be it decreased productivity at work, or like I mentioned earlier, patients who fall asleep when they're reading, they can't read the newspaper because their lids are just so droopy and it makes them feel tired. Um, and when they do that surgery and they now feel 
greater levels of energy that can really correlate with a higher level of happiness and just overall satisfaction um, in their day-to-day -day life because now they feel like themselves again. And I've heard that um, in many patients after surgery where it just they have their energy restored aside from the vision. I can imagine. Um, Dr. Pundit, maybe I could ask you the same question because uh, I would imagine the same holds true for the surgeries that you perform. Yeah, it really does. And it's funny, as Dr. Malik's talking, I'm finding I have to open my eyelids more because <laughs> <laughs> I realize how droopy they are. And when I open them, I just get more life in me. It's, it's uh -huh. so true that you mentioned that. And similarly, you know, when patients come in with cataract surgery, obviously, it naturally, uh, there's a great uh, enhancement in the amount of light they see. So their quality of vision, uh, their, their functionality improves dramatically. Uh, things like depth perception, ability to read in low light conditions, ability to you know, drive at night, which a lot of them have given up as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we find that it just patients' uh, lifestyle improves dramatically. Right. Yeah, uh, not only opening your eyes more, but uh, recognizing that <coughs> in today's presentation, I'm the only person in the room with glasses. Um, <laughs> so coming back, Dr. Pundit, on your presentation, the four T's, um, you know, I, I wonder if there's a fifth T and that's time. When is the right time for patients to consider cataract surgery? And, and how do you go through that with your patients? Can, you know, can they wait too long? Or are they approaching it too early? How do you find when is the right time and how would you advise patients when is the right time to come see you? Well, you know, that's, that's a, a great thought because um, uh, there's two approaches. One is, um, uh, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Uh, but the second thing is we know that even in early stages, uh, not too early, but in you know, earlier moderate stages, uh, the impact on their vision can be greater than what a lot of patients realize. Um, we have two subset of patients who come, to cataract, come for evaluation for cataract surgery. One who have an early cataract and feel very bothered by it, uh, and we have to discuss with them how they're bothered. And if it's significant enough, uh, of course, it has to meet the criteria for insurance coverage and all that. But <laughs> if it's causing some sort of impact in their activity of daily living, we consider it visually significant. Whereas I might have a patient who has a really dense cataract where I know the impact on them is pretty tremendous in terms of less light perception and all that. But they tell me they've got a bright light at nighttime. They've got big magnifiers. They don't drive at night. And they're able to read and do what they need to at home. And they're, you know, they're comfortable with that. Then we really don't have to you know, strongly uh, push them in the direction of cataract surgery. We provide, we provide them information and they can decide for them whether it's beneficial at that time or not. Uh, or not. Uh, there's no really early time to do cataract surgery if it's visually significant. What I will say, the only you know, variant is that if you're kind of on the borderline or on the fence, generally speaking, if you're operating on someone under 50 years old, mm -hmm. and yes, we do have some age-related cataract patients who come in in their 30s, mm -hmm. so it is there. Um, but if you're under 50, there might be a little bit more risk of, of, of issues, long-term issues with the retina. That's all we have to be aware of. So, so on those earlier um, cases, a, a, a secondary question, of course, comes to mind, and that is, do replacement lenses, do these things deteriorate over time? Um, are revisions necessary? How does, that, how does that fall into your practice? Fortunately, lens implants nowadays um, stand the test of time. When I started practice, there were some lens designs that uh, you know, lost their luster, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, maybe within five to seven years. Uh, it wasn't tremendous, but maybe one line vision loss. Nowadays, lens implants pretty much last forever. What you might hear, and patients uh, tell us this all the time, is uh, my friend or someone had a secondary cataract. So they had to get it taken care of. Mm -hmm. And what we tell them is it's really more what we call a posterior capsule or pacification, or basically a film behind your lens implant where we just kind of take, a, you know, we, we, we kind of dust the windshield, so to speak. Uh, we take a laser and we just remove that film with a laser. It's not, it's not a really a cataract, but some people may consider that deterioration, but technically it isn't. Okay, got it. Um, just a little polishing. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Malik, maybe I could ask you the same question. I mean, in, in your practice, um, how often do you see revisions or needing to do a secondary surgery? And what are the, what are the reasons behind that that you see? Sure. So, you know, in general, I tell my patients that eyelid surgery should last at least five to 10 years, and sometimes it can last longer. It really is individual, dependent on their rate of aging and how much mechanical stretching is going to continue to occur. There's no way to sort of, unfortunately, stall that permanently. Um, but the rate of a revision surgery, uh, you know, there are, I'd say about 
five to ten percent of the time where maybe the lid is not quite open enough where mm -hmm. we'd have to go back in to try to make it a little bit more open um, you know luckily uh, the eye being too open is a risk from the surgery but in my practice I've almost really never had to go back in to lower an eye that's too open um, because it's always easier to go back to make it more open than the opposite uh, so in general that risk of revision is low um, it does exist and then for repeating the surgery it can be done so if that skin does restretch mm -hmm. over a 10-year period um, you know 20 minutes in the office and we can just remove some of that extra skin again. You mentioned in your uh, presentation there was at least one alternative to surgery. Are there are there other alternatives to surgery? You know, for the upper lid droopiness, mm -hmm. there's not a lot out there. Um, you know, for lower lid um, redundant skin, there are some good mm -hmm. laser options. But for the upper lid, it's very thin skin. It's right. the thinnest skin on our body. Um, so we have to be careful with using some of the um, fractional laser devices on the upper lid. So not something I typically recommend. Not too much. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm checking the screen real quick. Oh, we had a, a, a new question come in a, a little bit um, beyond the initial presentation, but question regarding floaters. Um, maybe could you speak to that a little bit more, um, Dr. Pundit? You know, floaters, what causes them? What can be done about them? So floaters are uh, nuisances. <laughs> in most cases, they are just nuisances and nothing indicative of any disease. So that's the first thing to tell everyone. Um, floaters come in the vitreo, uh, in the vitreous, which is uh, about four fifths of the back of the eye, the volume of the eye. It's in the back of the eye, behind the lens, uh, and it's a territory that's usually managed by vitreo retinal specialists or retina specialists who do retina surgeries. Um, the floaters are a natural aging process of the eye. So if you think of your um, the jelly in your eye being kind of firm and hard, and as you get older, it goes from that nice thick hard jello mold to kind of a melted, kind of warmed up jello mold, and it starts to shift around and move around, and within it, you see some of the collagen fibers condense. So that's what floaters are. Um, typically, people get used to them. In some severe cases, uh, or in certain patients who are very observant of their floaters and they're right in the center, perhaps, in their vision, mm -hmm. uh, there are potentially options to take care of them. Uh, some people do tout lasers. Um, there's a lot of debate on that. Generally, that's frowned upon by the retina specialists that we use, mm -hmm. uh, including our own retina specialist, um, uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, uh, there are surgeries that can be done as well, vitreo retinal surgeries, or basically a vitrectomy, mm -hmm. which is their bread and butter surgery, similar to my cataract surgery. Um, uh, those have their pluses and minuses, so in certain severe cases, those can be done. And the interesting thing is, uh, we've realized in the last few years with some of our really advanced technology lenses, what would be typically considered as mild floaters or vitreous cineresis, which is kind mm -hmm. of a filminess, fogginess in their vitreous, can actually have a significant impact on the quality of vision with some of these advanced technology lenses. Mm -hmm. So there is some thought about perhaps operating on some of these patients that we may not have earlier. Mm -hmm. Interesting. From my own experience, um, I finding myself being perfectly average in this conversation, uh, floaters from time to time, I always find myself the hardest thing is to forget about them. Yes. Like once they pop up, <laughs> to, to get to a point where you can just kind of forget about them, let, let, the, uh, the, let the brain overcompensate for that. Um, in your presentation, coming back to the T's, I'm curious, um, you presented some really interesting technologies. Uh, maybe you could speak to what do you see coming down the pipeline? What do you see new technologies? Where do you see advances of, in the field that are getting you excited? Well, the holy grail, so to speak, for lens technologies is a lens that actually can change shape or two optics in a lens that kind of move back and forth and create sort of a kind of a, a, a lens that, that is able to truly focus or a truly accommodating lens, as we say. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be amazing. Uh, there have been a lot of advances in that field and none of them have come to fruition uh, other than just, you know, clinical trials. So uh, we're still waiting for that, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. in terms of diffractive optics, I think we've kind of come as far as we can in terms of the quality of vision and the improvements in, in full range of vision. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, you know, lasers and other approaches, you know, it would be nice if we had a laser that could actually completely neutralize the lens and then a way to make an incision in the lens where we could kind of soften it up and just suck it all out. There has been some thought about that, again, in, in early clinical trials, mm -hmm. which hasn't come to fruition. So if we could truly do that, and perhaps even in the future do an injectable mold type of lens, which could fill that bag up, that natural uh, capsule of your lens, and mm -hmm. fill it up, and then that mold could actually change shape, that would be amazing. Uh, those are technologies that are you know, thought about and worked at at lab levels and some clinical trials, uh, but nothing that's really come to fruition mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, it seems, seems a little complicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, let me check to see uh, other questions that are coming in. Let me ask a question that's on top of my mind. So I, I come from this from a little bit more of the research side of the equation. Um, 
both, and I'll put this out to both of you, remarkable clinicians, I can only imagine incredibly busy practices. Um, you must have tons of ideas that you want to answer, right? Questions that need answers. Um, how can we help you with that, um, with your practice? Because this is always part of Houston Methodist is not just great clinical care. We're an academic medical center, and so we have to be able to pursue new inquiry ourselves. So, you know, with those questions and trying to manage a busy practice and get those questions answered, um, how can we, Houston Methodist, help you with that? Sure. Um, you know, I do have a lot of questions that come to mind. You're absolutely right on a day-to-day -day basis. That's part of being a scientist is that, you know, we're always thinking about uh, what questions we can answer or how to make things better. Um, and I think that if there was a, a research fellow that was dedicated um, to sort of helping the department um, answer some of those questions and get those projects going, because it is a very time-consuming thing, research, as you well know. Um, and when you're trying to run that busy uh, clinic and see patients, it's hard to sort of find the time to do both. So that's where I think having an individual who could help, um, you know, with the actual steps involved with getting those research process, uh, processes going would really be helpful. All right, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Just having warm bodies to help and have an interest and then, you know, do some of the work that we just really don't have the time right. to. Occasionally, if I have a resident um, that, you know, is able to dedicate time over their second or third year and able to look at data, even just do some great retrospective studies, which, you know, can get as recently as January published in some of the top anterior segment journals in the country, um, you know, that's great. But how many times do we get a, a resident who's that motivated and able to take the time from their yeah. daily work as well? So having someone, you know, on the ground to really show an interest in multiple areas of ophthalmology would be fantastic. Right. Well, uh, it, it sounds like we, we certainly have a need. And it sounds like, you know, we are Houston Methodist. We're in Houston, the, uh, I think, the most generous community in mm -hmm. the country. And so I think maybe we have an opportunity to see what we can do philanthropic philanthropically to maybe raise some funds and see if we can get a research fellow or figure out how to be enablers for you to, uh, to maybe solve some of these questions that you have. Um, let me take a pause here and, um, and just ask for any final thoughts from our presenters. You know, I tried to uh, raise questions that have been brought in, a couple of questions I had, things that I wasn't smart enough to ask this morning for you. Um, you know, I think I just want to thank everyone for your attention. Um, it really is a pleasure and a joy to be um, doing what I do. You know, they say you don't have to go to work if you enjoy what you do, and I feel that way every day. Um, it's it's a Methodist is a wonderful place to work, and it's been very satisfying and rewarding to have my career here. Um, and you know, appreciative of the team that we have built at uh, Methodist Eye Associates. It really does take a team, as Dr. Pundit mm -hmm. talked about, to get the job done. Um, so very grateful for all of their support um, and for the patients who put their trust in me every day um, so that I can do the job I love. Yeah. Wonderful. Dr. Pundit? Any well, well said. Hard to follow that. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I agree completely. And also, you know, what I would tell uh, patients, uh, like I tell my friends who ask me about XYZ or ABC, is, um, you know, when you seek eye care, uh, you know, feel comfortable with where you're at. Um, you don't have to come to us. Uh, we want you to have the information, and that's part of what this is about. Once you have the information, then you're you know, well-armed to go to your surgeon or your optometrist who's going to refer you to someone, and just be well-informed, and that's the most important thing. If we can provide that service to the people in the community, that's what we want to do. And if you happen to choose Houston Methodist as your provider, hopefully we can provide you the service that you're looking for as well. Right. Well, Dr. Malik, Dr. Pundit, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Houston Methodist. You know, I always walk away from these things really invigorated. I mean, how lucky are we to be in Houston, to be at Houston Methodist, where we have world-class clinicians, we have the ability to support them academically, um, and when we say taglines like leading medicine, it's not just a line, it's actually what we do every day, and really just um, inspired by the work that both of you do. So with that, I'd like to bring this to conclusure. Um, I want to remind everyone that next month, um, hopefully we'll have uh, Dr. Boom back for our 36th uh, town hall meeting. Um, that meeting will be focusing on tissue engineering and lung transplantation. Should be a, a very exciting presentation. There's a slight change in schedule next month. It'll occur on a Wednesday uh, at 1030, but please look for the invitation and register early. Uh, until, until then, please stay um, safe, healthy, and happy. Thank you. <laughs>